Theorizing that one could travel within his own lifetime, Dr. Sam Beckett stepped into the quantum leap accelerator and vanished. He woke to find himself trapped in the past, facing mirror images that were not his own, driven by an unknown force to change history for the better. His only guide on this journey is Al, an observer from his own time, who appears in the form of a hologram that only Sam can see and hear. And so Dr. Beckett finds himself leaping from life to life, striving to put right what once went wrong, and hoping each time that his next leap will be the leap home. Theorizing Hey, I am Scotty R37. Antiderivative Jill will be here, and Steve is calculating the odds on how Ziggy is going to get us out of here. The Phantasmagorium Show proudly presents In the Loop a Quantum Leap Celebration. Sam is left into a paranormal investigator to find ghosts, and then uh, he leaps into an 80s version of Animal House to stop domestic terrorism and a paralyzation. Um, yeah. Just as the 90s began. That's the first episode in 1990. For a oh, really? And just the gentleman that we were discussing. Ahoy, Dalek. Hi, Dalek. Yes, we were just wondering where you were. And Scotty says it's 3 a.m. where you live, so you must be asleep. But here you are. Hello. You you have quantum leapt. Um, and the link is now... In your corner, if you wish to join, you are more than welcome, sir. You do know your quantum leap. How are you, Jill? Welcome to 2023. I'm doing great. Thanks for asking. How are you? I'm doing okay. Good. Um, this is a really... Yes, we were talking about... Well, we were just talking about you because you know quantum leap. And so we were wondering if you wanted to join mm -hmm. us. I had mentioned that I'd sent you a message, sir, from the imaging chamber. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, First leap of 2023, uh, I we are in the second season, and uh, second season, episode 11. Wow, we've been plowing through these guys. We um, haven't because we go two at a time, so that's a pretty true. efficient way to get through Quantum Leap. The two that we are, we are going to be discussing today are A Portrait for Troyan mm -hmm. and Animal Frat. Yes. Um. Both of these episodes, in my mind, are, you know the premise, now we're just doing adventures. That's right. That's exactly what happens here. The first one is a spooky one. The second one is a copy of, well, I don't know if it's a copy of it, but it's, um, it has the themes of Animal House, but different, a different story. Well, it's like if Animal House had, again, oh, I think. The, the, had put, um, Vietnam War. Yes. If Animal House had uh, Animal Farm crashed into it, because there is there's domestic terrorism. Hmm. Anyway, uh, in, in an effort to draw attention to the Vietnam conflict, of course, and so it's trying to be topical and it's trying to be social commentary. But ultimately, these are just Sam is doing stuff in the past and it's kind of a gimmick. It's just an excuse to get Scott Bakula in different scenarios. Yes. It doesn't add to the science. It doesn't do anything with the time travel aspect aside from him traveling through time. like that. It's barely mentioned. In the first episode, we get almost not, none of it. And the second, it barely, we barely know it even exists. Mm -hmm. this, the, the only way we know about it in the first episode is that the little device lets people hear Al. 
Well, shall we get to a portrait for Troyan now that I've sufficiently pooped on both of these episodes? I And I don't mean to sound like I'm uh, unenthusiastic because I do think that these are sort of, you know, it's the new year. It's January. It's cold outside. These are sort of like blanket episodes. These are the ones that I usually skip over. That's fair. And um, yeah, so... A Portrait for Troyan is our first one. It first aired on December 13th, 1989. Mm-hmm. And the story for this episode was created by John Hill and Scott Shepard. The only other uh, Quantum Leap episode John Hill wrote was Starcrossed. And the only reason I bring him up at all is because there was an odd thing about him on the page that says he reportedly died, but details are sketchy. And so really, I get that families want to be private, but just knowing whether someone is alive or not doesn't seem like that big of a pry into someone's life. So, Unless there's some sort of weird uh, inheritance scheme. Yeah, maybe somebody need to pay off their gambling debts. Maybe. Exactly. <laughs> I have no idea why I got distracted with that. I couldn't find anywhere anything about him. The teleplay was written by Donald P. Belisario. Did you have any creator. slides or anything or no? Oh, yeah, I do have slides, of course. I didn't know. That. I don't want to impose. You always do so much good work. And I'm just another person asking you to do homework. Well, sure. If there's, well, you don't ask me. I do it on my own. Thank you. I do appreciate it. You're, yeah, you're welcome. Well, and you know who uh, did you, when you did your research, where did you go? Well, I go to a number of places. I go to the Quantum Leap Wikia. I go to Al's Place. I really love Al's Place. It's definitely a fan-made site with forums and lots of cool stuff. Mm -hmm. And then I use Springfield, springfield.co.uk for looking up the episode script in case I hear a quote I really like and I just want to copy it down. Uh, oh, nice. Know, rather than having to parse out what everybody's saying on that Right. I can, I can grab it from there. Uh, what sources do you use? Uh, IMDb and I watch the show. Great. That's, I watch I know. Too. I'm lazy. Um, but do you know who's in this episode? Who plays Dr. Melvitz or whatever his name is? Yes. Uh, okay. Well, you're talking about the reflection, right? The reflection Dr. Mintz. is. Yes. Dr. Mintz, the reflection is played by the creator. Donald yeah. P. Belisario. I, you know what? I was so surprised because I went and I uh, went and checked my my research, and I was like, "What? Donald P. was in this? That's fantastic!" It was interesting to see him as a young man. Believe it or not. Yes. Not only that. Uh, also, Troyan is played by the co-producer Deborah Pratt, and only now did because of this episode. This was the fun, finally the moment where I realized that Deborah and Donald were married. And they had a daughter named Troyan. Really? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's, That's adorable. Right. So this is sort of like a wedding present for both of them. This is the couples. Everybody was on set at the spooky set. Yes. Uh, producers did get involved in this episode. Creators. I think there was even one of them. One of the dead bodies is also played by another producer. I don't Probably. Which one? The dead one. The debt, well, hmm. thank you. But um, bum, <laughs> possibly. So Sam leaps out. This is all the preamble. Yeah. Um, also, this episode was directed by Michael Zinberg, and Sam leaps from where was he before? He was from... playing Don Quixote. He was the man of La Mancha. <laughs> right. That episode. I feel like I actually need to go to the theater one day to actually watch that to appreciate it. Because I have no idea. But at I the beginning... Yeah. The beginning of this episode, Sam thinks he sees a ghost, but it's just Troyan, who is, who is, who is looking for the ghost of his, her dead husband, Julian. Julian, yes. Oh, and by the way, Jill, uh, just for the record and for my own entertainment, can you just for the duration pronounce it ghosts? No. Okay, Sorry, thank can't you do that. very much. No, I thought I'd ask. I thought I'd ask. If I, if I feel it, I'll do it. But thank we'll you. At your discretion. Oh, yeah. 
Uh, so yeah, this is after Men of La Mancha, and he uh, leaps <laughs> into Donald Pleasance, really, from Halloween. It was a dark and stormy night by the, what do they call those, mausoleums? Mausoleum? I would just called it a tomb. Mausoleum T is correct. That's a and good so, word for it. And then, yes, we have the uh, the widow uh, Troyan. She keeps hearing voices of her dead husband everywhere she goes. She knows and, he must be around. Yes. And so it's about to rain, and she says, well, we must get inside, and decides to go into the tomb, the mausoleum, the little place with all the dead people. Mm -hmm. Crypt. He's been dead for three years. Yep. And Sam has leapt into Dr. Timothy Mintz, a parapsychologist, on February 7th, 1971, somewhere near L.A. in California. Troyan's brother and... And uh, the Miss, what's her oh, name? Oh, right. The Miss Stoltz. Is that the lady from, uh, is that the Romulan lady? Yes, the Romulan lady. Okay, cool. The Romulan, and she also plays the alien from the first episode, contact. the episode First Contact. Yes. It was very nice to see her. It was a pleasant surprise. Anyway, Fozzie Bear is here. Fozzie Bear. We haven't seen him yet. Portrait for Troyan. Yes. Go. Now, the only thing, and I was neglectful on this one because it is a very snoozy, it was a dark and stormy night, quiet episode. Was there actually an earthquake around then? Yes, there was actually an earthquake around then. Okay, cool. Thank you. Anyway, there's our um, Romulan. I can, and, I can skip ahead to that. Oh, well, anyway, this is, she, this is creepy uh, oh, housekeeper. Well. Well, she's not creepy. She's severe. You know, she absolutely is creepy. This is a Scooby-Doo episode. Scotty. It is. Yeah, it is a Scooby-Doo episode. You're right. Yay, I like this episode way more now that you've called it a Scooby-Doo episode. You really? Yeah. It makes now it all of a sudden, Al is, is, is Scooby. Yes. <laughs> ro, ro. Anywho, so yes. Now, this guy... I remember this guy from being Kate's boyfriend on the Drew Carey show. He was uh, the guy who stole away Guy's girlfriend in the movie That Thing You Do. He always plays sort of a smarmy uh, preppy guy. And yeah. That's what he so, does here. And he does that here too. And he's got like 70s mullet. He almost looks like Martin Riggs. Well, I was going to say he looks like early 90s. Uh, uh, oh, Nathan Fillion. Nathan Fillion. <laughs> Nathan Fillion had better hair. Oh, yeah. But that's why he's early 90s, Nathan Fillion. Uh-huh. Well, here his name is Jimmy. <laughs> hey, Jimmy. <laughs> it's a different it's... Jimmy, not that Jimmy. Oh, okay. Moving on. And... Oh, right. So no one likes Dr. Mintz because they think he's a fraud. That's right. That's Donald P. Belisario. But handsome fellow. As far as frauds go, he's one of the best uh, in his field, which is why he has such advanced equipment. Yes. And that's Donald P. Belisario's wife? Yes. This is Deborah Pratt. And Excellent. she does an amazing job acting as though she's going crazy throughout this yes. episode. I was curious. I was looking to see. Anyway, I didn't see many acting roles. So I was like, oh, I didn't know her from anything. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and oh she, my God, she's wearing a Romulan uniform right there. <laughs> she kind of is. We meet Miss Stoltz, the housekeeper. She's played by Carolyn Seymour, who appeared in three different episodes of Star Trek The Next Generation. She was a Romulan twice, one sub-commander Terrace in Contagion, and then another Commander Toreth in Face of the Enemy. Commander mm -hmm. Troy's probably her best episode. And then yeah. also she was Marasta Yale 
in the Fantastic Next Generation episode, First Contact. Yes. So she was the scientist who ends up staying on the Enterprise at the end of the episode. So there you go. That is the most excited we're going to be throughout this entire I, podcast. I'm so happy. I just started talking <laughs> about Star Trek. Oh, but wait, I know. She, she also showed up twice on Voyager as Mrs. Oh. Templeton <laughs> in Janeway's oh. gothic horror novels on nice. the holodeck. Well, that's good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Al shows up just in time to be really freaked out by Miss Stoltz. He's, he plays the character, since Sam is the skeptic, uh, Al plays the one who might sort of believe in this stuff. Oh, so <laughs> Sam is Scooby and Al is Shaggy? Wait a minute. Do you think Scooby is a skeptic? Hmm. Well, no. Like I'm just trying to figure out who, who Scooby in this episode is. No, I think making Al Scooby makes sense. Okay. Yeah. So the, does that make Sam Shaggy? Or Fred? Or is he is he Velma? You know, I was going I was going to say <laughs> that Sam is Velma, but you said it first. I would agree. In this particular instance, Fred is Velma. And Alice is Shaggy. Well, and it's weird though, because throughout this episode they keep saying and that Dr. <laughs> Ziggy Dr. is Scooby. Ziggy is Scooby. Sure. Okay. Well, who's Daphne? That must be Miss uh, Schultz. Yes. Anything to talk? Anything to do to not talk about the episode? <laughs> eh? Okay. So. Uh, oh, oh, right. Al says, I don't know if I... Okay, so Mrs. Well, Stoltz offers him a, a hot toddy and Al doesn't think he should drink it. Because I wouldn't drink a toddy made by Lu Lucrezia Borgia? Yeah. Lucrezia Borgia? Yeah. I, I don't and know. I didn't get that? the reference. I don't know. I didn't get the reference. I. Okay. Uh, according to this, she had a poison ring? I don't even know. But well, I, it is a gothic horror sort of situation going on. So if they want to dig a little deep with their references to sound like they're worldly, then I'm she okay was, with it. She was an Ill illegitimate daughter of Pope Alexander the Sixth, But the problem uh, is that her life is just too complicated to do much research on. It was basically a, a soap opera that would make Pride and Prejudice blush. She, mm. Her life was filled with scandal and murder was a huge theme in her life so yeah and it would take a while to learn all about her hey matt but, g is here but you know you might want to do it if you're into renaissance age drama they don't have like electricity i don't i'm not a fan didn't think so yeah it's more it's too much like uh, uh, game of thrones it's exactly like that without the dragons. No dragons. So even more boring. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so anyway, the ghosts. Yeah, right. The episode is trying to give off supernatural vibes. But the key here is that the widow's trying to solve. We're, we're really solving a mystery here. Freaky yes. things are going on. And she's trying to, to figure it out where those voices are coming from. The lady who works in the house. Um. Miss Stoltz is creepy. And so you think that she's the one involved in the shenanigans. So she plays a red herring kind of character, the Romulan. Yes. Hello, Matt G. Ahoy. Anyway, it's wet. <laughs> yeah, I don't really have anything for this. Well, it's no, wet. Jimmy, she's following obviously. all of the wet. No, but Jimmy obviously got some galoshes, filled them with water, and walked. And he's been doing this for anyway. This is we find this out later, and yeah, yeah. But the problem here is he gets he makes everything all wet. But how does he make the painting just drip forever? Uh, I don't know how he makes it drip forever, but I. <laughs> Well, I guess if it was on a canvas, then it would be like wood and it would have floated. I don't understand why she would have thrown it in the lake anyway. It's just going to be like a pad. And I don't understand. Unless she 
overturned it. No, it's still going to flow. So, well, Sam is a scientist, so he is naturally rebelling against the paranormal possibilities, saying she could be hallucinating Julian's voice um, out of anger for his absence. Troyan believes Julian has now brought the painting back to the study. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was really weird at this point to learn that Julian is still in the lake. Usually when somebody dies who you love, you get a search team to ex excavate the body from the lake, right? Right. No, they, they, just, they just leave. This family just leave. Anybody who, dr <laughs> yeah. anybody who drowns stays in the lake forever. Well, yeah, you know where they are. I guess so. It's on your property. So then she hears the voice again. And Although I guess that like a contaminant. <laughs> they say like later on they say that the the lake is very very deep and it preserves bodies very very well. Well, yeah, so, it preserves bodies because it's really cold, so it's it yeah. freezes the bodies, kind of like uh, natural cryogenics. Sure, well, but not because they're already dead. Right. They, yeah, you can't bring them back to life because they're right. Born. But still, I get your meaning. Mm -hmm. So anyway, but I'm skipping ahead because, mm -hmm. yeah. Because, yeah, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, she keeps hearing her. She keeps hearing Julian's uh, voice. Uh, and we're all trying to figure out what's going on. The only really interesting thing that happens with this is that uh, people can hear Al. And it's usually when you're around one of the sort of paranormal spectrometers that he's got going on with the. So, you know the paper and all those wiggly lines and so people can hear when that thing and al are in the same room which is a neat twist uh they don't know necessarily how it works whether it goes yeah they don't exactly al or it. if it gets from direct from uh if it goes through sam or if it's direct from al nobody knows but it's a thing that they have to contend with in this yes also, Julian wrote novels and Troy and illustrated them. And the the voice keeps calling out to her the whole episode. And Sam's impressed with the ghosting uh, the ghost hunting equipment. Not and also notice that it picks up his brain patterns from when he leapt in. Oh wow. Then, yeah. Like that's one of the most interesting things that happens in this episode. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I missed it. I didn't know that until you said it right now, because I I must have dozed off. I was like, yes, yes, the ghosts. What that are the is, ghosts? That is, that is partially how they believe that Al is able to project his voice to the past. is through the machine that it reads his... It, it, you can input his voice into it, but how does it output his voice? I don't, I don't know. Mm. Oh, maybe it's like there's some sort of harmonic that makes it so that everyone, like every human in a certain radius, like mm -hmm. I would say it probably goes through Sam. And yeah. because Sam's brain waves are tuned to Al. And so if yes. that thing is there, then it's trying to record everyone's brain waves. So maybe that harmonizes them so that there are residual effects for other people around in this case only auditory how do you like that yeah well that, that okay? works yeah that works okay. so long as there's a speaker on the device well no because there's no speaker from al to sam it's all no nerd. well right the i mean once the brain patterns are inputted into the device itself how does it project it from there I think that it just harmonizes the brain waves because it is in range searching for brain waves and thusly like sort of again putting the brain waves on the same frequency and thusly they become attuned to hear the same things that each other would hear and in this case Al. Okay. It's it's flimsy, but it's the best I got on <laughs> short notice. I don't have So and on then my side. and then of course we already know we can Solve the mystery already, right? Because we know the brother is the one who's doing this. He's making creepy paintings. Well, he just sort of shows up Columbo style at the end and says, I did it. Yeah, and no, like, but, okay, but the whole right. episode, you don't know he's done it because he's acting as though he cares about his sister and that he doesn't want her to go insane. But really, yeah. that's exactly what he wants. 
Exactly. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And this, oh, this that's the point where Al says, oh, well, he, he can hear me, so I'm out of here. Leave. Oh, and there's oh. one of the pictures that it was an interesting it was an interesting narration for the for the books too it was like the gothic novels were uh, were beautiful but disturbing almost too dark if not for uh what's her name Troyan's uh pictures whimsical they brought beauty to the horror or something like that and it was just like wow all right laying it on thick on the on the the tone of the episode they did and then a little man appears in the mausoleum, so she dashes outside to go towards the mausoleum. Right. Sam rushes after her. She goes to the grave, as indicated on the painting. And this is where we get our earthquake. Yes. And she's locked in the tomb as it begin to, begins to fall apart. And she falls through the floor next to human remains. And Sam helps her up. And about that earthquake, California's, oh, how do I say this? Slymar? Silmar? How do you spell Silmar? it? Silmar? I'll put it in the <laughs> private chat. Sounds good. I, I should have considered. I don't know if I'm able to get this, ladies and gentlemen. Silmar. Silmar. Is Silmar. It Silmar. Silmar. I think it's I Silmar. Yep. California's Silmar earthquake occurred on February 9th. 1971. So it was timed well around this episode, which started at oh February seventh. Uh, give me a little bit. Oh, for sure. Uh, Dalek four five one says this is the first of several supernatural episodes in this show. Each one more weird than the last. Well, I'm you know I've seen clips of it. I'm looking forward to the one where Satan takes over Al. Uh, apparently that's a supernatural one. Uh, apparently the fandom doesn't talk about it. I've heard I haven't seen it yet. Uh, I'm looking forward to it though. And uh, but yeah, the supernatural ones, and also like even when we get to Animal Frat, there is a brief sort of um, reference to uh, oh what oh God sitting this one out, and then Sam's like I wouldn't be so sure. And so there are there's always an over tone of supernatural when it comes to uh quantum leap i think this is the first supernatural episode right yes you're a little loud jill just so you know i'm loud just a little uh-oh now now you're good how's that a little louder a little bit louder now i don't know what's happening why am i there loud? you are you're perfect you're perfect you're perfect so the California's Silmar earthquake was re mm -hmm. was the worst recorded quake in the city's history at the time, I guess. I don't know if it's still the case now. San Fernando Valley was hit the hardest at the epicenter, and scientists at the California Institute of Technology said it measured 6.5 on the Richter scale. Wow. So that's a pretty big one. That's, from what I understand, yes. It shook a mausoleum. And here is your only hint that Jimmy does anything at all. He can fix electronics. He's a yes. he's an expert at fixing electronics. He's troubleshooting the TV. And Miss Stoltz says she doesn't watch TV. I bet she loves the Twilight Zone. Was she, she in the Twilight said, Zone? No, but I, that's what uh, Sam says. And I wish <laughs> he had said Star Trek. <laughs> but I guess at this point she had already been on Star Trek, so I, he wouldn't have been able to say it. Right, but it make it makes sense to pick the Twilight Zone because that one is a little more creepy and mm -hmm. more some some episodes are certainly supernatural on the Twilight Zone. It mixes the that genre with science fiction quite a bit. Well, and the the sort of tail end of this ends up being kind of like a night gallery episode. Mm. But I guess night gallery? Yeah, no, that was late 60s, early 70s, so maybe not as popular. Moving on. I can reminisce about gothic horror shows from the 70s all day, but yes! Yes. He I'll be is, right back. Absolutely. So here is where uh, the guy from that show, you know, um, he's fixing a television set. He's the murderer. 
Uh, well, not the murderer. He's trying to drive his sister crazy. And we are eventually revealed that, um, yeah, he's been putting tape recorders about the estate and trying to drive his sister insane over the grief and loss of her husband. Playing upon... <laughs> oh, I was I knew this was going to happen and I knew Jill was going to have to step away briefly as she does and has every right to do so. But I knew when she was going to walk away, I was going to be like, oh, I hope, I hope it doesn't happen in the middle of these episodes. They're so anyway. So he's so oh, these are warm blankets. These are these are episodes you curl up and fall asleep to. There is no plot. They find out it was him. Through. Tape recorders about the place. Uh, and he basically admits to the crime and says, well, this driving you crazy thing is taking too long, so I'm going to have to kill you. Jump into the lake. That's how you'll prove you're crazy. And she's like, I'm not going to. And um, yeah. Oh, but there is a cool thing where uh, Al does sort of speak from beyond the grave when... And actually, any time that Julian is speaking from beyond the grave in any part of this episode, it is Dean Stockwell. Really? Yeah. Oh. Well, what about the recorder devices? Yeah, like the that's recorders? him too. Really? Yeah. Uh, I, I'm okay. pretty sure. I think that's what I heard. I believe you. I believe me too. Troy <laughs> is upset that there might be an alternate explanation than a haunting because Sam is trying to tell her. That, hey, Lemon. That the machine, she, he says, see, these lines might represent shifts in the electromagnetic energy that preceded the earthquake. And so he says that, uh, says that the machine functions as a seismograph. And Troyan is upset that it might not just be all these voices that she's been hearing. And hello to Lemon Pie. Hey, great to see you. It is great to see you. He and Sam, they, they investigate the aftermath. Sam investigates the aftermath of the earthquake and how the machine picks up Al's voice through Sam's brainwaves. And yeah. for me, that would make sense if the machine were just recording evidence of his voice, but how does it translate into an echo of Al's voice? And you told me your explanation my, for that. Just a theory. It's a good theory. How could it be? Yeah. So anyway, from this point on, just so long as you have this machine, Al can communicate in in the past. Oh, Luckily, yeah. they throw it into the lake. Yes. So something tells me they'll never utilize this this discovery ever again. Ever but if again. they do, I will be paying attention. And well, anyway, we now know that the hologram frequency is registered as supersonic on the device used by this this machine. Okay. An electro in cenephilograph would show yep. Sam's brain waves instead of the ones of the leapy. So for me, that further proves that it's Sam's body leaping in with just a projection of the leapy on him. And the real Leapy is definitely the one in the waiting room, played by Donald Belisario, who thinks mm -hmm. the character, the actual Dr. Mitz, thinks he's been abducted by aliens. So, you know what? Okay. How does the projection work? Because it doesn't work in... Well, no, I get it. So it's his body. But there's a projection. There's a natural prog uh, projection. And that's why his mirror reflection is not himself. But it is physiologically Sam Beckett. Yes. Okay. I like that idea. And we get Al's best line after. You can, you're always free to come up with the alternate. Mm -hmm. But we get Al's best line after Sam teases him. I'm not into necrophilia. 
<laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I yeah. kind of laughed at that. No, and then Sam said, finally, something sexual that you're not into. <laughs> Troyan is sitting, uh, she's sitting by her typewriter, <laughs> begging it to tell her something. This is where she's really, she really shines as somebody who's just going out of her mind. I thought she, it was Julian's uh, teller, uh, or typewriter. Yes, that is Julian's typewriter. My yeah. Speak. Well, she believes that he's a ghost. <laughs> well, she almost makes me believe that the thing's going to start typing. I thought it was. And she hears a voice again, and now the painting has her drowning on it now. There it is. There now she's there. <laughs> Sam's excited that he's detected a battery transmission as he excavates the grave. And as Troyan walks into the lake, <laughs> what's she looking for again? It's the oh, it's the voice at the end of the pier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She didn't walk into the lake. <laughs> I'm What's sorry. so funny? What, Nothing what happened? funny. Well, you're laughing like you went crazy. Well, maybe I'm going crazy. Just okay. Like, I'm just like trying. I said that she walks into the lake. She walks to the lake. I was wondering if I was going to see her waiting. Anyway. So yeah, walks, and, and yeah. Mrs. Stoltz is pretty happy about this for some yes. reason. Yes. We never know really what her motivations are or how much she played into Jimmy's plan. Uh hang on a second. Let's get there. She just let's get smiles. To, let's get to the end. Let's get to the end. And okay, then we'll so, reflect on Mrs. Stoltz. So the battery thing Sam found turns out to be yes. a tape recorder. It seems yes. like it's quiet, but Sam realizes that it may only be audible to those sensitive to high frequencies. Like dogs. And seismographs, and the, the weirdest thing, it also says women. So, but Al thinks there are more recorders around, and that's a good bet. Sam looks for a Troyan while Al uses Ziggy to call Goshi so he can center him on his coordinates. And Mrs. Stoltz locks Sam in the study, and we get an amusing threat to Ziggy from Al. You tell Ziggy if he doesn't center me on Troyan right now, I'm going to feed his sex sensory microchips to Tina's crocodile. And, and then so, he gets centered. Yeah. And so now we know that Tina has a crocodile. That's the only reason I read that. You think it was Mrs. Stoltz who locked the study? I thought it was Jimmy. Was it Jimmy? I thought it was Jimmy. It could be. I don't care. Okay. And this part is pretty great. Uh, where like you said earlier, where Al's voice is, he's using the machine to project mm -hmm. his voice to tell her, no, do not kill yourself. So that's good. Yes. Trust that face. Mm -hmm. And we find out it was Jimmy who was behind the hauntings because he needed to pay back some, some sharks because he, he got in trouble for gambling in Las Vegas and he wants control of her finances. Yeah. Well, Al, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so he wants power of attorney and all that. And Al continues to pretend to be Julian. And this does freak out Jimmy, but he finally tosses the seismograph thing in the water. So Al can no longer speak to him. And another er earthquake begins as Jimmy tries to drag her to the lake. Julian floats to the surface. And this whole episode, I've been wondering why they even, you know, just leave their dead bodies there. Mm -hmm. But this, okay, so Sam rushes in and pushes Jimmy and himself into, into the lake, but. I need that for my Tinder profile. Wait, what? <laughs> Jimmy with his lustrous hair as he turns his head super quick because you can't really tell what the guy looks like, but you know that he's got like a rock and roll bullet. <laughs> oh, okay, but I need to get a better one. That one's blurry. No, I want the blurry one. Okay. Okay. I'm not. I. I'm not on Tinder. I'm just a joke. You don't actually have to send these to me. <laughs> well, I like when you ask for a picture. And I no, I know. It, anyway, it, it's funnier when I say so. Why, then, because it's ridiculous. 
Yeah, well, it is funny, so don't worry about it. I'm not. All, all the bodies have wash up somehow. They were shook loose or something like that. I'll be well, right no, back. No, the police come. The police come and they dredge the bodies. Look, there are people here. Uh, this character, this young lady right in the vest. Yes, absolutely. Uh, but yeah, and apparently they've gone in and they've looked for a lot of bodies. And they found a few. Um. Dalek451 says, we see Stoltz go down the stairs after the door is locked. Okay. Again, I did not notice. I have a very comfortable couch. I know I knew he got locked in, but I wasn't sure why or by whom. But considering that uh, Stoltz, <clears throat> pardon me, is a specter. She is the only ghost Stoltz is the ghost. That's it. So, which we will see shortly. They even have to, uh, they uh, I exhume, uh, surface the body of, of Julian. And uh, yeah. What's her name? Torian. Troyan. Troyan. I know. Mm. I can't, I cannot remember that name. It's so foreign. It's just weird. Well, yeah, and Troyan has a Exotic. brother named Jimmy. <laughs> exactly. James and Troyan. Uh, okay. Who's your favorite? It's not Jimmy, I'll tell you that much. So no. he knew what he knew the difference between right and wrong, and he chose wrong. That's what he says in the episode. Um so yeah, so this is when uh she goes and she identifies uh, Julian and for an, for an uncomfortable amount of time I yes that even, there was even Sam comes up too so. and then um, you we already talked about how these bodies were preserved in the lake yes well we talked about that earlier right we did it's very, very cold and very, very deep. And so almost uh, at zero at freezing. So the bodies are very well preserved. And then. Yes. And there was a, we completely skipped this part, but there was, there are other people who were stuck in the lake uh, who drowned, were drowned in the lake because of an affair from the 1880s, 1800s. And they came up too, and they were also preserved. And one of them was a Stoltz. And who, what's the name of the housekeeper in this episode? Miss Stoltz. So is yes. this Miss Stoltz, who's dead here from the lake? Is this the same? Because, I believe so. Because at this moment, that's where we get our our first supernatural thing to happen in Quantum Leap, which is Mrs. Stoltz just poof. It's a bit, she just vanishes from right here, and then she's gone. Into thin air, she vanishes. Yes, she does. Uh, Dalek451 says, yeah, they do this twist ending thing a lot where the supernatural thing is proven fake only to prove it was real the whole time. Yeah, yeah. But again, I was saying, I, I said while well, you stepped away, Jill, that there is sort of a supernatural component to Quantum Leap anyway based on the spiritual aspect of who's controlling the leaps that we really haven't delved into point. again, but we're going to get back into it again. Well, Absolutely. And that supernatural force determines at which point in time Sam goes to. Yes. Well, maybe. And then he leaps back into season one. Well, I liked this sort of uh, cheat. Because they used this season one leap... And I was like, oh, so they're just going to cheap it out and they're going to um, uh, leap him out of this into whatever story is coming next for uh, Animal Frat. But in the beginning of Animal Frat, they show this as like, sometimes it's like this, sometimes it's like this. But they do show this as the beginning of the leap and then it's... But this is like a flashback to a previously. I appreciate the way that they structured it, watching it back to back. 
the wiki fan page says that this is due to the fact that NBC re-ran Kamikaze Kid during the holiday break. Similarly, the next original episode, Animal Frat, originally aired with a recap of Kamikaze Kid. Huh. Yeah. So that that's that was a portrait for Troyan. Yes. It, it was um a uh, episode that had the series creator and his wife and yes. was named after their daughter. And uh a, a prolific uh actress from Star Trek. And we appreciate everything that she's done in both Star Trek and Quantum Leap. It was nice to see a, a genre actor in her element. Definitely, and she does a great job of that in that role. Yes. I wish she got to do more roles like um Maritza. Maritza. Me too. As a scientist? Yeah. Yes. But oh well. Okay. But Shall we... she she tended to kill people instead. You know, well, she was good she at being a villainess. Yes. She would have been a good Cruella de Vil. Absolutely. Uh would you care to uh venture forth into Let's animal frat? Yeah, animal frat time. Definitely. Cool. So, in the last episode, Sam almost gets drowned in a lake. In this episode, he almost gets drowned by beer. At the very beginning, yeah, that's crazy. I never even thought of that. Oh, and, and also, uh, with Animal Frat, this is another one of those episodes where uh, you may have been deprived of some music. I was. I know. I'm getting furious about it. I'm going to get the better files soon. Okay. I have. If you want to tell me about it, I'll remember. I I did look through it. It does it does because the pages the wiki does tell me which epi- which songs I'm supposed mm-hmm. to hear. And I know I don't hear all of them. There's La Bamba, there's I heard La Bamba. Thing. Well, they sing it in the episode, so I was wondering if they got mm-hmm. around that. There's Wild Thing, uh, there's Louie Louie. I think yeah. there's one one song that I missed. There's Surf City by Dan and Dean. Yep. And I Can't Help Myself by The Four Tops. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. So all I got to hear was La Bamba, I think. I don't know. It's ridiculous. I I will change my ways soon. Oh, no, it's fine. It's just, it's a fun little thing that I can say. uh, I got music. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, so you prefer it this way. I do. I have power. I have an evil. Well, I don't like it. I'm gushy. (laughs) I don't even know what that means. So it's been a while since we've seen gushy too. We got to get that guy back. That's true. So this episode first aired on Animal Frat first aired on January 3rd, 1990. So we're in the 90s. And so I'm not a baby anymore. It's great. Yay. It was written by Chris Rupenthal and directed by Gilbert M. Shilton. And I think it's really, uh, I think it's funny that they cut in the Kamikaze Kid, but anyway. Sam leaps into getting liquid poured all over him. Of course, it's beer, Mm -hmm. the bottom of a keg. Because they're in a frat house with young men doing frat things and having a party. And these actors are who's who's of... Do you remember that guy? Like probably Bri- not. Brian Haley is a stand-up comedian who is in many, many things. I think he's even been in a couple Cohen Brothers movies. He was oh my god, just a guy that you would see. Stuart Fratkin, Fratkin, who is also one of the 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 frat boys, oddly enough. Um, he is in I remember him from ski school. Ski school. Okay. Yes. That was an early 1980s sex comedy. Involving uh, skiing. Involving skiing and topless women. Um, what else do we have? And that's it. That's it. Uh, and uh, yeah, no, I recognized all these guys and I went back to try and find out who they were. And I was like, eh. Mm, no, man. Mm. Someone barfs on Sam and they're Someone lobsters. barfs on Sam. And there's like some pledge stuff happening. Hey, don't turn your nose up at sex comedies. You know, Tim Russ was in an erotic thriller. 
Did I turn my nose up? I don't know if I meant to do that. Maybe exactly. I'm being defensive. Maybe I'm being defensive. I do like Tim Russ when, you know, he's playing guitar at the Star Trek convention. Nice. I've seen him in his undies. <laughs> and you nice. can too. <laughs> Anybody in the audience can see Tim Russ in his underwear. There you go. That's great. And Sam has leapt into Nut Walton, who is also known as Newt. Wild Thing. Not Nut, Newt. 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 Oh, Newt. Nut okay, like Walton. the lizard. <laughs> I don't want to call him that. Uh, you have slides, do you not? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I do have slides. Sure. Let's, let's look at the slides. Who's that? Well, it's Nut Walton. <laughs> Did you say Nut Walton or Not Walton? Newt. Newt. Okay, Newt, like the lizard. Got it yes. now. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, there's a reason why they call him that. Anyway, this is Scooter. He's a pledge. Yeah, he's uh, got he's, lobsters. He's got a lot of side quests that are going to be for hilarity, but also speed bumps in the social sociability of, uh, of Sam mm -hmm. and Stacy. Elizabeth. No, the actress Elizabeth. Name is Elizabeth. Elizabeth. Stacy Edwards. Hey, yes. Good job. Darren Dalton. Wow, thing lives here. And he's also, oh, he's quite the cad. He finds twins in his bed. Twins, Basil. Yes, he has twins in his bed. And he kicks them out so he can go to sleep. Was that Jennifer Hetrick? I don't know. Who are they? I don't know who they are. No, I'm. You're just, right. I'm, they are twins. They are, but yes. So anyway, um, they leave. <laughs> they, they're gone. And oh right. Vietnam War protests. And Vietnam War protests. Yes. Uh, fight power. Stop the war in Vietnam. In now, war. I do appreciate that because we are introduced to these protests from the chemistry class. Yes, from the chemistry class, the frat kids are pelting water balloons at everybody, including yes. a groundskeeper who is just trying to do his job. Yes. Like this poor guy. And he falls yes. off, too. I didn't get it. Al's it's on board. Al is mm -hmm. on. Well, and you know what? Considering the recent events to... No, Jeremy Renner, don't mess around when you're on heavy machinery. Exactly, it would it could have been a terrible tragedy if that lawnmower could have ran over him. Exactly. Oh my stars! So anyway, here is a Renaissance festival costume, and I guess this is like flower power. This is '67, right? '67 is right. Yeah. So it's the burgeoning it's flower bit, power. It is. But where are geographically? Do you recall where we are? We're still in California. It's okay, somewhere, sounds good. Somewhere in California. Let me see. Sounds good. Let me go back up and see. Okay. If I have the actual place where it is. No, I just know somewhere in California. Sounds good to me. Oh. So well, they do have a luau later, is it? It's not Hawaii. It's a Meeks College in California. Hmm. That's I'm not familiar. Says. I don't know if it's a real college or not, but Sam says, I'm trapped in the body of a troglodyte. Which, and, you know, considering all the things that he said before, this isn't the worst one. No, it's not. And it turns out that Newt Wildton is an art student, and Ziggy says there's an 87% chance he's there to help Elizabeth Spokane. Yes. Right, because they're going to plant a bomb in the chemistry building. And they shouldn't do that. He references how lots of bombs were planted in the 60s, usually protesting departments whose research was related to the government's war efforts in Vietnam. Yes. Before you change any slides. Yes. Okay. So... First things first, I think it's really weird that this episode is sort of a mission to stop 
the bombing of a school. Like that's what the, that's what Sam is sent back here pretty much to do is to stop the bombing of a school. Yes. Okay. Because it ends up killing somebody. Yes. Which and everybody's life is ruined, of course. All right. Correct. So it's just weird because this is the first. Well, I don't know if this is the first time that it's been. No, this is fine. Is this an okay intervention in time? Um, I I don't know. I guess. Like, I, I mean, it's a. If we get into the time travel discussion, I'm going to say it's a different timeline. So, it's it's a. It's fine. Well. My only problem with the different timeline aspect of it is that we're still dealing with Al. Right. And he's obviously on a continuous timeline mm -hmm. unless. Well, that's how the show works. The show wants us to believe that it's all one. Right. But I'm just saying, as long as there is someone coming back from the future to talk to you through it, as Al does to Sam, that means that it kind of has to be the same timeline. Mm-hmm. You don't want yeah, to even touch this with a ten foot pole. <laughs> yeah, according to the writers of that uh, the series, it is one timeline. Uh, well, yeah, that's the romantic. And, you in know, me. They, yeah, well, not, you know, the, not the map. Lots of lots of lots of writers like to write uh, time travel incorrectly, but I still enjoy it. Yes, it's not about the lyrics, you green blooded Vulcan. It's that you have a good time singing it. Mm -hmm. Oh, don't okay. I anyway. Well, what do you? Second, how would you so, answer the question you asked me about how how the if it's a uh, if it's a proper intervention in time compared to any other intervention? Uh, because well, if you just step, you know, you just step just the just the act of time travel itself makes a change. So, what's the difference? Any change is going to be catastrophic no matter what? Yeah. Well, possibly. It could be. Butterfly effect. Well, exactly. So there wasn't supposed to be anybody there, but apparently there was a kid there who ends up being killed by the bomb. And as a result, Elizabeth has to go underground and running for the rest of her life. Sam tries to apologize for the behavior of his frat and tries to help her with her cause. Okay, wait, 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 wait. Before we, we move on, there was a second thing I wanted to ask, and it's very important. Yes. Have you ever seen anybody dressed like this before? No. Like, if you were, what would you even remotely, like, aside from, hey, hi, like, that's the extent of what you have to say to this person. What would you say to be like, like, I just find this the goofiest outfit in the history of, of wardrobe. She looks fine. She kind of looks hippie-ish, but still reserved. But this guy, hmm. he looks like a Joker villain. Like a hmm. henchman. Anyway. Hmm. Are you not amused by this costuming at all? I don't know. It doesn't mean anything to me. But right. I like. I do appreciate your... You're you're the fashionista here. I was enamored by this. It's crazy. <laughs> it is. I would not wear that to the prom, or mm -hmm. a or an anti-Vietnam rally. I would like to add. Right. Not so, the beret. Lose the beret. It's just too much. <laughs> Two on the notes for you. PVP is here. Hey PVP. Hey PVP. Hey, that's great. Uh, PVP says they look like 60s hippies. Well, they are in 1967. Yes, they are. They are hippies. And yes, this is the 60s. They, they're anti-war hippies who want to blow up the chemistry building. Well, not yes. yet. Not yet. Well, they don't know they're going to do that yet, but that's what, that's what oh, Sam is here right. to stop. Or cause, which is a weird thing as well in terms of the time. This episode really fumbles all the time travel stuffs. 
it does. Oh, of course. Sam wants, when doesn't it? Sam wants to help. When it makes me blind to the joy of it. But when the, when it actually does, it's like he had to be here. Anyway, mm -hmm. you were saying. And Duck thinks Sam just wants to be with Elizabeth, but, but he did realize that Sam is more intelligent than he seems or that he's used to seeing, seeing him as. And Elizabeth is prying at the chemistry professor to figure out, um, you know, why the chemistry department is helping with the war effort. And Sam says what should be done, what should be the concern is what the South Vietnamese want, because once they have to quit, there's no way to win the war. And that's in this scene, all that happens here, where this guy's making a balloon out of a glove. Yes. Hijinks. These guys are the three stooges of the episode. They do comedic stuff throughout. I find mm -hmm. it kind of charming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just they just do stuff in the background while we're while we're watching the plot happen. While we're watching the adults, yeah. And right, he relieves Scooter from having to wear underwear um, over his clothing. Mm -hmm. But can't stop him from stealing the basketball because he, Scooter says he ha needs it in order to be in the frat. Um, Sam tries, tries to justify the act of pledging by paralleling it to the passage of rites rituals in the past. Yes. Which comes back up at the end of the episode. He's still wearing that stupid outfit. Yes. Is that a, is that a coral shell necklace? It is. Probably. Oh. Mm -hmm. and do you know which character is Raphael Barge? S. Barge? S. Barge? Because uh, I don't know which character he is. Do you? Yeah. he Raphael Sparge. Um, he is the tallest of the guys. Uh. He's part of the, you know how, okay, so there's buzz cut guy, there's dark hair guy, and then there's tall guy. He's tall guy. Okay, so he's the tallest one? Yes. All right. He's been in a lot. Um, like he's, I'm going through his IMDb right now. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to find something that you would have seen with him in it. Well, the only but, one I wanted to mention was that he abandons the Voyager crew to become a Kazon spy. Oh, really? Yes. He was in Voyager? Yes. This is why we're friends. Yes. And then we go back to Duck leading the meeting about ending the Vietnam War by any means necessary, even if those means are violent. And Al says that these kids joined the cause to end the war because they're they feel guilty because they were rich enough to avoid the draft and they have a sense of uh, rebellion against their parents for this. Would you say that they are checking their privilege? Well, I would mm -hmm. say that most of these, you know, leftist ideas started on uh, university campuses, just like this one in the late sixties. You curse. Well, the way, that, the way that Al, <laughs> Describes it that way. If they're feeling guilty because of their affluence, then yeah, that kind of feels like that. Yeah, but anyway. just but just class based. It is. It isn't as. It, it's just class based. Yeah. I make I make I make fun just because you know more, the more things change, the more they stay the same, and it depends on the prism that you're looking it through. And that sort of rebellion and, and fighting against the system was sort of revered in, in 1990, and now you know. Things change, but they're still the same. Sure. Elizabeth believes that research done for the military industrial complex makes the chemistry department as guilty as the people dropping the bombs. That could be depending on what the chemistry department is studying and testing. We really don't know much about that, except that it has to do with the contents of the bombs. I guess that's what they say. That They say that the contents of the bombs are being developed on the campus. So that's the only explanation we were we were getting. I was worried that they were doing Agent Orange experiments or something, but that doesn't come up. Sam well, asks, "Oh, I I wonder if this is the uh, 
if this could have been the sort of chemistry lab that made napalm or something. Well, that's why I was considering. I don't know. Hmm. I don't know what they were dropping out of those bombs. It could have been anything. Could be that. But never finding that out, Sam asks Elizabeth to the luau so that she won't be at the party. She won't be party to the bombing of the chemistry building. He offers to pass out flyers for her cause. And isn't worried about the young Republicans group, I guess, who who he was a part of before the leap. And this impresses her enough to go with him to to the luau. Oops. Well, and putting putting Sam's brains into that body for Elizabeth, you know, compared to Johnny Vesty over there. Speaking yes. of which, Pleasant Valley Picker says, buzz cut, dark haired, and tall guy. I am so glad Scotty doesn't name TV character names for real. Why? You don't like, you don't like Vesty? <laughs> Scotty's space series would feature Captain Space Guy. <laughs> this is very true. This is very true. So anyway, Vesty over here. <laughs> well, also Sam refers to Elizabeth as Abby Hoffman, who protested the Vietnam War in reality. On October 20th, 1967, several hundred people marched to the Justice Department in Washington, D.C. to turn in thousand, a, a thousand draft cards on October 21st. Thousands of people demonstrated against the Vietnam War in D.C. The coordinator was Jerry Rubin, co-founder with Abby Hoffman of the Anarchist Radical Youth International Party. And that's all. That's just an aside. Well, in its historical context. And that happened shortly thereafter from this episode, yes? Yes. And also on a different coast, so. Mm -hmm. Like, that's one thing. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't know. Go for it. No, no, please. After you. After you. Okay. Scooter passes by and throws a basketball to Sam, as Sam asked. And somebody does a prank call after this. There's a prank call about a bomb in the chemistry building, which yes. is which is exactly <laughs> actually, actually what happens later. Yeah. Sam is so angry about it, he puts the phone back on the receiver with such force that the whole phone falls out and falls onto the guy's foot. I don't know if that was I don't know if that was on purpose. It must have been on purpose. Yeah, it, re- it reminds you of how fun it used to be to slam the receiver on a phone. Yes, I loved that feeling. But also, um ladies and gentlemen, 1967 when a bomb threat was considered a prank. Yeah. Well, I was a kid. I was in high school in the early 2000s. And there were lots of bomb threats during that time. You, you can imagine why, because it was around the World Trade Center, mm-hmm. the loss of that. And there were lots of points during during tests where we we'd have there'd be a bomb threat, and everybody would have to leave. It, it, we'd have to leave like it's a fire drill every single time, and then the whole day was shot. And that happened a whole bunch, and that's it. That's the end of the story. Well, I, yeah, and you know what? I because as we know, I'm Canadian. I don't mm-hmm. even think that they would have said that it was anything other than a fire drill, even if there was something going on. I'm no, they sure told they, they would always tell us it was a bomb threat, and well, but it was done when, by cell phones. The kids would get these ghost phones hmm. and prank the school. Well, wow. one way to get out of tests, I guess. It was very annoying to me. Well, and also you had to get your coat. You Sometimes you couldn't even get your coat. You just had to get out of the building as quickly as possible. And you're standing in the cold and stuff. Oh, well, no, I didn't have to worry about that. I'm in South Texas. It was never cold. Damn it. Well, think about the Canadians in the group. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. So they're, they're pretending like they're studying their chemistry. But even with the book open right in front of them, they don't even know how to plug in no numbers into a freaking formula. So they're going to fail. But That's Sam, <laughs> I mean, seriously, you got the book. These right knuckleheads can't even figure out. They basic. can't even read. <laughs> yes, go on. <laughs> Sam just does it all in his head, which uh, I couldn't do, and gives the answer. So they all they all want to cheat and copy off of him. 
during the test. Mm -hmm. As you do. Mm -hmm. And he said, and Sam's like, no way. And yeah. so he, he refuses to help them. Definitely. So to the tune of La Bamba, they, since, you know, La Bamba is the bomb in Spanish, they're going mm -hmm. to the ladies dorms to put cherry bombs in the bathroom. Yes. Oh, but you missed the uh, you missed the topless lady. Oh yeah, I did. I'm sorry. I uh, I think there was a there was a topless lady with a gratuitous bum shot. Oh, I'm sorry, guys. No, it's I, fine. I, my apologies to everybody in the chat who wanted to see those ladies. I don't know why I missed out on taking. No, I understand. It's fine. I get the editorialization. It's it's. I didn't right. mean to edit them out. I just no, it's yeah, they just right. didn't make my cut. I am nope. sorry. I am not a, a toxic male. I'm toxic. You know? This is so, the moment where you say, Scott, maybe you should make the slides. Maybe you should make the slides, <laughs> Scott, next time. That's, okay, that's a good point. That's a very good point. <laughs> uh, I, I will keep this in mind for next time. So anyway, they blow up the toilets. Yes. Using Speaking gum, of which, but gum Jill, is not flammable. So Jill, I'm know. going to go and blow up the toilet. I'll be back in just one second. Okay. So, I, like I was saying, I don't. What I don't understand about this is that they use gum on the cherry bombs, which isn't flammable. So I don't know, but they still work. So the toilets blow up, uh, just as Scotty's doing right now, as he's he's blowing up some toilets. He was inspired by this episode. And Elizabeth catches Newt as part of the prank on the women's bathroom. And here are the toilets exploding. And Elizabeth catching him. And Sam goes to the library to, to try to convince her, to try to convince Elizabeth that publicity using media is the key to stopping the Vietnam War, not violence. So the, the pen is mightier than the sword is the cliche that he uses. And Elizabeth thinks now that Sam's only motivation is to go to the luau with her. So he has to drop some of his own real history. He reveals finally that he's lost his brother in Vietnam. And Duck says some absolutely terrible things about it. He disrespects the dead. He says, you should have thought about that before he went. And so Elizabeth apologizes and decides to go with Sam to the luau after all. Well, and that's not that's not Newt's brother. That's Sam's brother. Yeah, Sam's brother. Right. Okay, cool. I'm back. Yes. Yes, that's right. Because Sam is using... Sam doesn't know anything about Newt. So he has to use his own history mm -hmm. in order to relate and this was something that definitely relates to this episode very heavily and will come up again in the series later well it's kind of it's it's an unfortunate plot point for uh newt and elizabeth mm -hmm. is because when sam leaps out then one day elizabeth is going to say well, tell me about your brother who died in vietnam and newt's gonna be like what are you talking about babe not only that, it, it, if they stay friends, will will he retain any of what any of his personality that Sam had while the leap occurred? I don't know. Is does any of that those memories transfer? I think they do. Again, it's one of those things that we'll find out about more when we get to the Lee Harvey Oswald episode because they really go into that. That's good because that's what I'm more interested about when I'm watching Quantum Leap. Yeah, no, and again, these are warm blanket episodes. These are just, we have a premise, let's do an adventure, but there's not really any lore exploration or world building. No, except that Tina has, has a crocodile. 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 My, mistake. my mistake, stop yelling at me. Don't sick Tina's crocodile after me. I might. <laughs> you may. Uh, Canadian Spider-Man is here. Ahoy. Hey. <laughs> Whoop, there it is. What a great show, says Canadian Spider-Man. Hi. Nice, to, nice to see you, sir. Uh, and Pleasant Valley Picker says the '60s were great. That said, though, there were negative as well as positive things happening. True, such as no gratuitous bum shots. That is a negative. <laughs> well, there goes my evening. I ruined everything for PVP. I'm so very sorry. 
Canadian well, Spider-Man anyway. says, do not screw with Captain Archer. Absolutely not. So Elizabeth and her group, they they finally, they're inspired by the cherry bomb event. They decide to plant an actual bomb in the chemistry lab mm -hmm. because of the prank. And Sam tries to call in the bomb threat to the chemistry lab, but because he's part of this frat and their reputation, they believe it's a prank. Nobody believes him. And I will be right back while um, after yeah, these you, after these messages. Uh, yeah, and so at this point, we find out that the bomb has been remotely. Uh, triggered it's got a countdown uh, and it's going to go off at 9 p.m so knowing that because uh the goofballs uh you know buzz cut guy dark haired guy and tall guy they uh they have sent scooter to the chemistry lab to steal the exam for monday because uh, they won't uh, be able to cheat off of Wild Thing, or Newt, as we've been referring. And so, yeah, that's the individual who will die in the explosion. And so Sam, at pretty near this moment, uh, with Elizabeth there, says, so where the hell is the bomb? Where's the bomb? Because she says, oh, no, it's going on. We've already set a timer. It's great. It's all going to be great. We're going to send a message. No one's in the building. It'll be fine. We're just going to blow up a campus. That's all. Campus building? Yeah, sure. Uh, and so Sam's like, no, Scooter's there. So, and I don't want to get too far ahead because I know Jill's going to be really interested in the action scene. L let's just, okay, no spoilers. There's an action scene. Scooter, apparently, I don't want to give it away. Um, oh, but Jill is back because the slide has moved. So anyway, Sam is totally like, no, you got to tell me where it is. And she says, it's on the top floor in this locker. And he's like, okay. So he's like, okay, I'm going to call in a, uh, a bomb threat, but they think it's just a prank. And so... Uh, He's like, well, I got to I got to go. I got to go and find it. Uh, and Ziggy, uh, you know, there, here we go. This is where Sam says, where's the bomb? And she says it's at, at this place. And he runs to go stop the bomb. But we find out that Scooter had come back. Yeah. And now Ziggy is saying that it's actually going to be Newt and uh, Elizabeth who die in the explosion, which doesn't make any sense because uh, Duck should die in that explosion as well. Yes. He was omitted by Ziggy somehow. Somehow. So anyway, uh, everyone's all super jazzed because they think that Wild Thing is going to go and steal the... Uh, the Chemistry the test. And so they sort of follow because they think this is all a prank. They don't know it's life and death. Uh, and so they find a bomb, a sizable one. It's in a locker and it's got four, uh, four uh, wires that need to be cut very quickly within five seconds of one another and so sam has to go into a lab find some scissors bring them back and then he and elizabeth will clip them in order it goes like what is it uh red white blue orange I yes I think, I think i blew our uh, blew us up uh but then we find out right. but then we find out that the bomb it didn't stop counting down. That's there must be a second bomb. On the oxygen tank. Yes. And so Duck has it there. And again, and this is why I brought it up at the beginning of this particular episode, is that they are everybody's introduced in the chemistry lab for uh, the class. And that's where they establish that they're launching things out of the window with the, ca with the catapult or whatever. <laughs> Yes, Slingshot. they set up the catapult at the beginning where they were just shooting off water balloons. Yeah, and so this time they take the bomb and they... Uh, they do the same thing they did with yep. the water balloons. And then they just explode. 
Yeah, so it explodes in the air, hurting nobody. <laughs> yes, no windows were broken in the making of this explosion. And they have their luau, and Sam goes through his ritual. And no, <laughs> A lot of pictures of the explosion. No one called the cops or anything. He says it's bitchin'. It is bitchin'. Yeah, nobody calls the cops about the explosion because I guess it's it, if it explodes that way, it's just a firework. Was it just a prank? This is the most unruly campus in the history of, of colleges. <laughs> it is. And they talk about stuff and they have their ritual. Oh, yes. The cultural appropriation of the episode. The cultural appropriation of this episode. <laughs> you know what? This is kind of kind of off. I don't know. It's I guess it's supposed to be Hawaiian themed. I think it's fitting for the, the era. It is. It's 1967. It is culturally insensitive. You know and, why? Because they were in 1967 culturally insensitive. Mm-hmm. Well, it some wasn't people call it malice. Cult- it was some, costume. Right, exactly. I, some people call it cultural appropriation. Others call it appreciation. I call it good, wholesome fun. Mm-hmm. That too. And this is the last thing Sam has to do to leap. He has to make sure that that Newt does not break his neck when he jumps off into this pool of water as the god of the luau. You know what Newt would have done? Dove, which is why he no, his neck. He, I, you know what? I think he cannonballed. Right, he would do some kind of trick. And Definitely. Sam did the, just did a starfish belly flop, and it was the good call. Yes, there was no broken neck here. He no broken in, neck. And he's fine, and he leaps. Aloha. And to. The never-ending work of being a mama. Yeah, a, a oh mother. My God. I'm really looking forward to this episode because there, I can, I already know from the beginning, uh, the tease for next week mm-hmm. is that one of them is a, uh, one of Blossom's brothers. Blossom's brother, like me and Blaze. Yeah, like brother? from the show Blossom. Okay. So I'm looking forward to seeing that actor in his uh, youth, in his prime, as it were, one of his first roles. Great. But yeah. So that was Quantum yeah. Leap for this week. Yeah, we did it. Yeah. Those were the episodes. It, you know, that that was like a half a bottle of red wine, a warm blanket, and turning up the thermostat too high. Mm-hmm. That's what those two episodes were. They were comfy, but they didn't do much for me. They didn't wow me or nothing. No, and we didn't get to learn too much more about anything right well except and for it, when, or except for <laughs> tina it did make me think about vietnam and how maybe i can brush up on my knowledge of history for that but not too much in depth just a general just a general discussion on the merits of and the demerits of the war in general well do you think we're going to be getting like as this episode or as this series, pardon me, goes on, like we are going to be getting sort of a perspective of you, not only the creators and but the characters as well. Like, and we are going to get a Vietnam episode. Absolutely, and like, it's one so, of the best ones. Uh, yeah, and so I don't know. I'm looking forward to going through and sort of discovering the 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 through line of the of the characters and the story but i do like it oh i like it so much better when they talk about the time travel and the implications just anything the, about anything anything I about don't. the quantum physics or the time travel is more fun definitely or even us. the physiology which and i think that that was the most interesting thing that you brought up when it came to um uh portrait for Troyan. yes you missed out on the brave way brain waves that that the machine picks up Al's voice through Sam's brain waves. Mm-hmm. Well, and also just in terms of Sam being uh, physically leapt. Mm-hmm. That too. Then, well, I mean, I brought this up before. I, I know, and I I'm still it torn. I'm still all over the place when it comes to this theory. I'm, I'm, I'm not yet convinced. It always falls in place for me. Okay. I don't see anything contradictory of it, but if you find something, please tell me. 
I'm just on, I, you know what? I am so happy to have you along on the ride for us to watch these episodes. I'm not trying to find holes in your argument. I'm trying to come to an agreement on what the heck this wacky show is all about. <laughs> yes. And I'm, I'm down for that. So cool. Let's keep so, exploring. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so I don't know. Uh, do you have anything else you want to say about these episodes? No, Did that is all say, I had. That's all you got? Those are all your notes? Those are all my notes, and we have a couple of chats. Well, I did want to... Yeah, we do. Let's see. Where do I start? Where do you want me to start? Wherever we left off from the last one. All right, well. We only have a few. I'm scrolling so up and down. Let's say hi. I mean, Pleasant Valley Picker and Canadian Spider-Man are here. And Let's go. Oh, I know where we were. Oh, Canadian Spider Man almost got sunburned today. Why is that good? You need to wear your sunblock, Spidey. I'm scrolling up. Okay. <laughs> there we are. <laughs> there we go. I think it was around here. But before we get to there, I did want to say ahoy to Dalek Matt G and um, uh, Dalek Matt Lemon G pie. and Lemon Pie. Anyway, Canadian Spider Man says, Scotty and Jill, hail to you both. Eh. Is he still in Mexico? Yeah, yes, he's in Mexico until until sometime in the spring, I think. Makes sense. Uh, do not mess with Captain Archer. No kidding. No, who decides to do that? Uh, the Zindi, mostly. Uh, Canadian Spider-Man says, I, ju I just missed the 60s, damn it. No, I'm happy. I'm so happy. I was two in 1980, and I was so happy. Uh, Pleasant Valley Picker says, uh, Spider-Man, hey there, suntanned guy. And PVP goes on to say, uh, I was only a kid then, but it really was a magical decade. It just had an atmosphere of culture that's hard to explain if you weren't there. It, the 60s? That makes yes, sense. That's what he's saying. I just, he has an know, experience. We don't. It's true. I just, I, you know, I'm a big fan of landlines. I like the only time that you got a phone call was when you were at home. Uh, mm -hmm. And Canadian says, uh, hello to PVP. Uh, Spidey says, I do remember almost all of the 70s, Pleasant Valley Picker. And that decade gives me the same feeling. Yeah, and I guess I got the same feeling about the 80s. And Jill, I assume that that's how you feel that's about the, the 90s. 90s. Yeah. yeah. Well, that was my childhood. So there you go. Childhood is fun. Mm -hmm. Mostly for children. Yeah. And I got sunburned a lot when I was a child. So, and, you know, when I grew up, I learned to put sunblock on. And Canadian Spider Man almost got sunburned today. But it was a good thing. So at least he enjoyed it. And Canadian Spider Man also says Jill and Scotty are always fun to hang out with. PVP. Thank you. And Thanks. Pleasant Valley Picker says, yes, the 70s were amazing. My favorite decade. Discovered Girls and the rock groups were amazing. We didn't realize the bands putting out albums then would become legends. I, I was put out in the uh, 70s. Well, there you go. You became a legend. No, that's not true. That never happened. Oh, well, uh, it could still happen. And then PVP says they are two of our favorite people. And I hope that that means Jill and Jill again. Yes. No, well, no, me, you too. <laughs> I'm making people watch the Lazarus uh, episode. Uh, yeah, right. Well, so am I. It's on my channel. It's true. And then PVP says one of the best things about uh, the series is that it's a history lesson. Yeah, usually. Even if it's in a pop culture TV show, the audience can still learn. Well, and like, that's why I call it sort of like a, a blanket episode, like a snuggly episode, is that it's still a period, like it's a, of its time. So like the one takes place in 1967 and the one takes place in 1971. And it's like, yeah, no, they do an effort to dress it for the era in which it is set. It still had a heavy topic about the Vietnam War, but put it under the cover of a comedy frat thing mm -hmm. to make it more lighthearted 
And then Dalek451 says, I missed the 60s, the 70s, and only missed the 80s. Born in the early 90s. Yeah, baby. He is. He's a uh, he's around the age of my younger brother. Oh. Well then, uh I guess that's uh that's it for, for this week's uh leap. It is. We can we, we can leaped. go like whenever we want. Well, let's leap out here then. Okay, so who says this thing? Is it your turn? You. Really? No, I thought it was my turn. It is your turn. Oh, I thought it was your turn. Oh, boy. Sam Beckett hunts ghosts. 